Hello and a warm welcome to the European Policy Centre's event on the EU-UK deal, a basis to build upon. Uh, my name is Janneke Wachowiak and I'm a policy analyst at the EPC and I will be chairing today's event. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by an excellent panel to discuss the new EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement. Um, thank you for joining us, Catherine Barnard, Professor um, of European Union and Labour Law at the University of Cambridge and a senior fellow at the UK in a changing Europe. Um, I'm also delighted to be joined by Elvia Fabri, um, senior research fellow at the Jacques Delors Institute and by Katie Haywood, professor of political sociology at Queen's University Belfast and also a senior fellow at the UK in a changing Europe. And last but not least by Fabian Sulik, chief executive at the European Policy Center. Um, before we start, um, just the usual housekeeping rules. Um, I will start with one or two rounds of questions to our panel and a short discussion among the panelists. But later I would like to bring in our audience and open the, flesh, the floor um, for questions from you. Um, there are two ways you can ask a question. Um, either you can click on the handshake button if you want to ask a question in person or you can write your question in the Q&A box. Um, if you want to send in a written question, I would just ask you to keep your question as short as possible to give me a chance to see at a glance what it is you're asking. Um, so turning to the topic of today's debate, um, Brexit and the TCA, um, at the end of last year, the EU and the UK finally reached agreement on their future partnership. Um, having a deal is of course much more preferable to no deal um, but what we are now seeing is that the agreed deal is a rather thin deal, at least compared to the ambitions that were set out in the political declaration. Um, this deal does not prevent economic disruption and it leaves gaps in many areas of the relationship. Um, a deal was always meant to be a basis to build upon, uh, a stepping stone for further cooperation. But there is a political question uh, whether the UK will actually want to improve the terms of the deal or whether it will want to gradually distance itself even further from the EU. Um, there's also a risk that the deal might crumble away as non-compliance can lead to economic penalties and potentially even the termination of the deal. So there are many things to discuss and I'm uh, glad that we have an excellent panel to discuss these questions with. And um, I would like to um, go to Elvia first and um, ask you how you see this deal and the implications of this deal for the EU. Um, when the EU and the UK opened their first round of negotiations on the 2nd of March last year, the EU was hoping to establish an ambitious, broad, deep and flexible partnership. Um, but the deal that both sides concluded is seen by many as a thin deal, which even has certain elements um, of precariousness to it. So in your view, is this a good deal for the EU? Does it safeguard the vital interests uh, for the EU now and in the future? And how much appetite do you expect there to be on the EU side to build on this deal in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Janneke, and, and good afternoon um, to all. Th thank you, Janneke and, and Fabian for this new invitation to, to discuss this, uh, uh, this deal in the in just the beginning of the process. So there's many comments to, to be done. Well, first of all, I think that we cannot consider uh, spontaneously the deal as a good deal, meaning that it's, uh, it, it, it is a deal that is uh, based on rebuilding uh, barriers between two parties. So it's a very unusual. I mean, it's, a, it's the first time we, 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 negotiate, we have negotiated that kind of deal. Having said that, um, it is also a deal that is um, built on defensive negotiation on both sides and that is built on red lines and um, that's where we have to, to, to assess. Is it, I, I think that it's, it's not enough to have a deal built on red lines. Red lines have been, um, have been respected widely on both sides and from that point of view, if we have to make an assessment on the EU side, uh, I think that uh, Europeans have uh, succeeded uh, maintain, I mean, uh, respecting one very um, structural red line, which was preserving the single market, uh, preserving the integrity of the single market. But um, uh, 
um, but this um, and and that there's there's a very strong asymmetry um, in in the the, the 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 implementation of those red lines between the EU side and the UK side. On the EU side, the the Europeans have succeeded to preserve the, the access to to market goods quite widely, and uh, of course they the. Uh, it's a relief to have this deal just to avoid the tariffs and quotas, and that's a very uh, that's a, that was a very um, uh, key element from the beginning. But I think that that's really that relief has been swallowed very quickly, and that we we're discovering in addition all the new frictions that are that are coming on that way. But that concerning the 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 market the goods for the market for goods, I think that Europeans have succeeded at least preserving. Um, the functioning of supply chains on the on the European side, in, uh, first of all, because um, the the rules that are preserved for rules of origin are not impacting the same way European supply chains as uh, British supply chains. The accumulation of uh, rule of origins between the UK and Europeans is preserving the functioning quite widely the functioning of uh, European supply chains. Where, while on the other side, if there's a stronger symmetry pre precisely on the UK side concerning that question that has been completely underestimated in the negotiation on the, on the British side, because they are much more dependent on uh, contributions also from, uh, from third countries outside of the EU. And that's a very strong asymmetry. Um, it, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was a, an intentional uh, objective on the EU side, but at, at least they have really preserved their, their interest and they have preserved the interest in limiting the capacity of the UK to become potentially um, a distributional um, uh, hub for the, for the EU, um, which, is, uh, w w which it was already and which it could have become uh, much more uh, offensively. Um, le, um, in, um, in, in, in a way, um, I think that uh, the benefits for, of this deal for the EU is, um, is, is really to have, um, uh, to have uh, built this new chapter concerning level playing field, which is a very new innovation for, uh, for a trade, for a trade deal, even if this deal is much more than a trade deal. It's, uh, association deal and dealing with much, uh, many, many issues. The functioning, the functioning of this chapter will uh, need many comments and I'm, we will probably go back on that uh, because it's a, it's a very extensive chapter covering as much uh, state aid. Uh, I mean, it, it's more specifically interesting for state aid and for labor and social and environmental climate change uh, standards more than on, on, on on tax and uh, and competition, uh, but there's really a lack of uh, clarity from on, uh, on the functioning of the, of this chapter. And to make good use of this chapter for the Europeans will require some uh, to to um, some clarification on the EU side on the intention beyond the letter. What is the spirit of the uh, the, the the Europeans will adopt to uh, to implement this chapter? Uh, because the criteria that will be used to uh, to assess uh, the the, uh, the concrete divergence uh, um, on the UK side. I mean, on the UK side, they they would they at the moment there's quite some important willingness to diverge, and there's a necessity to uh, demonstrate that there's some added value to to Brexit. Uh, how they will they will uh, uh, materialize this divergence uh, will, um, is, is an open question and how Europeans will uh, address this divergence and how they will respond uh, is, is, um, uh, is still a gray zone. I would expect Europeans to respond quite uh, offensively and quite promptly on first cases of uh, breaches on the uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, concerning the, the, the respect of uh, level playing field, and uh, that could be less, uh, that could give a good signal uh, of the, the way the Europeans are defending their, their interest in this uh, first phase of implementation of the deal. 
Uh, thank you, Avia, for this first assessment. Um, lots of very important points, and I think especially the question, um, what is the spirit in which the EU will um, implement the level playing fields uh, chapter and um, uh, how will this play out in practice is a very interesting one. Um, I wanted to come to Catherine next um, and ask you about the dynamic nature of this deal. Um, we know that the agreement includes various grace periods, transitional agreements and review clauses. And um, Catherine, you gave evidence to the House of Commons on the TCA recently. And during this evidence session, you said, and I quote, I think this deal is very unstable. And I say that because there are so many ways that this trade agreement can be brought to an end by either party. Um, I wanted to ask you to um, exp expand on this aspect of the stability of the deal a bit. And how likely is it that in spite of having struck an agreement, we could still end up in a no deal like state later on. I think you're muted, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for the um, invitation here. Um, just before I turn to that point, I think uh, there's a couple of points I'd like to make by way of introduction. The first is it is an extraordinary achievement that we have a deal at all um, to have delivered such an extraordinarily complicated deal. Um, in best part of 10 months really is quite remarkable and it's a tribute to both sides. And as Elvia said, um, it is essentially an achievement for both sides because both sides got pretty much what they want, which was a defensive ask. I often think um, it's a bit like two porcupines mating. They were doing it at arm's length and with a lot of care um, because they were worried about um, making concessions and crossing their own um, uh, red lines. Um, which were really very pretty strong red lines on both sides. Um, we have a deal and we're beginning to um, get under the bonnet now of the deal to see how it's working. Um, the question you've asked me is specifically about the stability of the deal. And legally, um, I would say it is potentially unstable because um, of the following. Um, uh, first of all, it can be reviewed um, after five years, which will exactly coincide with the end of the UK um, election cycle. And so the risk is that, um, certainly on the UK side, that if things are going very badly with the economy in the post-COVID world, and I sincerely hope in five years' time we will be in a talking about a post-COVID world, um, and if um, the UK itself is going through um, an internal revolution with Scotland um, in the process of trying to leave, um, it's always a good time to pull out um, the old card of blaming Brussels for all of this mess. And this might feed into um, what uh, is going to be um, argued in the manifestos for the parties um, at the time of the next election. And that's one of the reasons why I think um, it is unstable. Uh, the next reason is actually building on what Elvis, Elvis said about um, the application of divergence and the consequences in terms of retaliation. And as Elvia indicated, if it's done under the rebalancing provisions rather than under the non-regression provisions, uh, the EU is able to act um, pretty dramatically and fast. And you may well then see calls for um, those on the UK from those on the UK side to say, well, look, we can give a year's notice to terminate this agreement anyway. So we don't even wait for a review. We just terminate and um, trade on WTO terms um, has, has been argued before. So I think much depends on the politics. If, on the other hand, the politics calms down and the EU ceases to be front and centre of um, British political debate, as it has been for the last five years, um, there is, of course, capacity to build on the deal. And I think one of the things that is striking about the deal is how much um, space there is in the text for further provision. And indeed, there's repeated reference to the fact that the government's arrangements will apply not just the TCA, but any other bilateral agreement. So a more optimistic view is that this has the capacity to look more like a Swiss style arrangement. Uh, but don't underestimate the politics over the next few years. Really, really difficult in the UK. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for this assessment on the stability of the deal. 
Um, Katie, my question to you is um, somewhat connected to that question. Um, it's about the implications for Northern Ireland and um, what do you think, what does the combination of the Northern Ireland Protocol and now a thin TCA mean for Northern Ireland? Um, since the end of the transition period, um, we have seen some empty shelves in Northern Irish supermarkets and some disruption to supplies. Um, this already triggered calls um, for Article 16 of the Northern Ireland, Ireland Protocol, which is about safeguard measures to be invoked. And Boris Johnson said in the House of Commons um, that his government will have no hesitation in invoking Article 16 of the uh, protocol if there are problems that we believe are disproportionate in its operation. Um, what do you make of these statements um, this early on? And maybe I guess the broader question also to you, um, what do you think is this a stable and a lasting arrangement for Northern Ireland? Thank you very much, Janneke, and um, thanks Fabian for the invitation. It's a, a great pleasure to be on this panel and I'm very appreciative of your interest in Northern Ireland because as you recognize, Northern Ireland is in a very strange position of um, having watched two sets of negotiations um, over the past year, recognizing that the outcomes of those negotiations would be um, so fundamental to Northern Ireland's legal, economic and political and social future. Um, uh, one thing that strikes me about the TCA in many ways is the lack of ambition um, that it represents compared to the uh, nature of the protocol itself. Uh, and if we think about the protocol, its intention to address unique circumstances on the island of Ireland, to avoid a hard border, to maintain necessary conditions for North-South cooperation, and to protect the 1998 Good Friday Belfast Agreement in all its dimensions, it's an extraordinarily ambitious document, um, all of which centers upon the relationship of trust, um, good communication, um, and cooperation between the UK and the EU. This is very difficult um, now that the UK is a third country and it's difficult of course in the context of having an, agreed the TCA which is about um, minimizing those ties to the EU and um, being able to sell this agreement as reclaiming UK sovereignty. And this is the challenge that we have, um, that we witness um, Boris Johnson and his ministers trying to um, address through rhetoric in many ways. So uh, you mentioned Article 16. There's been a lot of calls from uh, certain quarters of the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party um, and other Unionist parties, pro-leave um, groups in Northern Ireland for Article 16, the safeguard measures of the protocol to be triggered. Um, and it is interesting that the, Boris Johnson obviously um, says that this might be a possibility. Um, but I think all of this uh, comes down to the fundamental fact that um, the, the realities of Brexit were never, or and indeed the protocol were never properly explained. Um, and many of the um, consequences of the protocol that we've seen in operation since the end of the transition period um, have been uh, ones that would be entirely predictable. Um, I think the the, uh, the fact that we had those joint committee decisions just before um, the TCA was agreed was absolutely essential, but there's very much a sense here that those um, agreements on grace periods just enable us to um, get through this very critical time in a way that minimizes disruption. There's a huge sense of, um, uh, of the challenge only growing over this coming year. Um, and uh, so fundamentally, if, we, if we're thinking about risks that might emerge to the stability of the protocol, I mean, um, as I say, everything depends on that UK-EU relationship. I'm very conscious that if, for example, the UK um, that does breach elements of the, of the TCA, the level playing field, for example, the, the EU may decide to take measures that would have negative effects then on Northern Ireland, um, for example, the imposition of tariffs. Um, and also, we're very much suffering the consequences of the fact that these very unique arrangements were never um, really designed for dealing with um, a, a market that is as integrated as the UK's market and Northern Ireland's with, with Ireland. It's an extraordinarily difficult situation. 
So to mention one issue that has come up for businesses in Northern Ireland that nobody really anticipated, it's the rules of origin question, um, which really reflects the fact that obviously FDAs don't tend to be negotiated anticipating that a third country would process something or do something minor and then it'd be re-imported back into the EU. This is of course the situation that we have in Northern Ireland and hence the complexity of these concerns for NI. And I would just expect these to grow over time. Um, so we're very glad to have a deal with all the issues that we see on the Irish sea border and the difficulties in managing that, uh, which are very complicated. Um, I should say, with, I mean, all businesses are just very glad that we're not having to deal with that on the Irish land border. It would be immeasurably more difficult. Um, and yet at the same time, we're very conscious of the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you, Katie, for this um, very interesting input from you. Um, so uh, Fabian, I wanted to also ask you, um, well, first of all, how do you see this deal in, in general? How do you see the nature of this deal? But also looking forward, how do you see the nature of the future relationship between the EU and the UK and the potential for conflict between the two? Um, luckily, the cliff edge and acrimony of a no deal have been avoided. Um, we now have a framework for cooperation, including a dispute settlement mechanism. Um, but what can we expect with view to the tone and spirit of the future relationship? Um, we are currently already seeing the first conflict with the UK refusing to grant the EU embassy in London full diplomatic um, status. Is this a sign of things to come? Well, we don't know yet. Um, I think uh, it is certainly not a good sign, um, and I'll come back to that. Um, but firstly, about the deal, um, I'm not going to repeat uh, things which have been said already. Um, Yes, it is a thin and precarious deal, um, but it is still uh, vastly better than the alternative, which was no deal. And I think we were still very close um, to no deal. Um, but what we are also seeing is that uh, the prediction of experts on the economic impact of such a deal are proving right. And they are proving right uh, despite uh, the much reduced volume of trade, uh, which goes along uh, with COVID. Uh, and I think that's something which is remarkable um, because if there would have been any time where you could deal with uh, greater uh, difficulties, it is when you have lower numbers. Um, so despite the lower numbers, we're seeing that things are difficult. Um, and we're seeing that um, I think, um, and that should have been clear, but it seems not to have been clear, that this is not um, a bedding in uh, process. This is not a teething process, uh, as, as some people have said, but this is the status quo. Uh, this is what is going to happen now on the UK uh, EU border. Um, and the difficulties, uh, in my view, will only increase rather than decrease. Um, yes, there are some areas where uh, things can bed down, uh, where things can get better. Um, but there are also factors which are going into the other direction. I think when we're looking at volumes of trade, um, the biggest uh, concern from a UK perspective would have to be if the volumes of trade stay as low as they are now, because that would essentially mean uh, that uh, businesses are not trading anymore. Uh, so it's not a positive sign. Uh, if we don't have those problems at the border, it could be a sign that essentially uh, most of the trade is no longer happening. Uh, secondly, the impact on supply chains is still to come. Uh, supply chains generally have um, cushioned themselves for a time. Um, they also have lower production at the moment because of COVID, um, but this impact on supply chains is going to come. Um, and what that means is essentially that it does not make sense anymore to have one part of the supply chain in the UK if you have to have repeated cross-border movements. Um, so we are going to see many supply chains uh, recalibrating and that will mean that business will shift away uh, from the UK, that investment will shift away from the UK. Again, it's probably not going to be spectacular from one moment to the next. Many people will not see it, 
but it will be a drip feed. It will be every time there's a consideration of whether you're renewing production facilities in the UK, um, and particularly in manufacturing, uh, we will see over time a further decrease in employment within the sector, in investment within the sector. And I think uh, the impact, which we haven't seen um, essentially because of COVID, is uh, on migration, uh, the numbers of people uh, which uh, are needed by British business in many different areas. Now, there is still a lot of uncertainty about how exactly that's going to work out, uh, because migration uh, is not determined mainly by the rules, but it is uh, very much determined by the perception of the people uh, who are moving or not moving. Um, so there will be a question about uh, how attractive the UK will be, particularly for the workers who earn higher wages, uh, who might think twice uh, about going to the UK in future. So I think these impacts are still to come. Um, and what it means is that Brexit uh, is showing to be a very significant economic loss. Um, that will also influence the politics. It will influence the politics within the UK and will influence the politics of the relationship. Um, I think within the UK, we are already seeing that um, the deal is not helping to turn those people who uh, were pro-Remain or who were opposed uh, to, to Brexit in some way. Um, they are not happy because essentially, uh, no matter what deal you have, it doesn't deliver the benefits of being in the European Union. Um, but we're also seeing now that on uh, the pro-Brexit side, many people um, are seeing some of the impact now. And we can see that specifically in some sectors um, where uh, certainly in the seafood sector, in the fishery sector, uh, there is a certain level of rethinking uh, of what is in their best interest. So I think the, the turmoil in the UK is going to continue. Uh, I cannot see that politics will settle down anytime soon. Uh, and that might also lead to short-term reactions because uh, for the government, uh, the only option now is to blame the EU for everything which is going to happen. Um, so any economic uh, negative impact we're going to see, any difficulties on the Northern Ireland border, uh, anything which goes wrong will be blamed on the EU. Um, and uh, that will continue to also fuel the internal debate um, in Northern Ireland, in Scotland, uh, in parts of, of England. Um, so uh, for the UK, Brexit will remain the most important issue, um, and it will continue to remain the most important issue, uh, in my view, for a long time to come. For the EU, it's different. Uh, the EU, in some ways, has already moved on. It's quite striking how quickly people are now thinking of the UK as a third country. Um, people are thinking, uh, yes, they look across the border, uh, they look at the economic chaos which is being created, um, a bit in a way, if you at least read uh, some of the continental newspapers, it feels a bit like, well, we told you so. Um, but it isn't really engaging anymore politically uh, with the UK. Um, the, the group of people who are interested in what is happening in the connection to Brexit has reduced a lot. The interest now is much, much greater, uh, for example, to look at the transatlantic relationship to see what is happening there. Now uh, that for me uh, means there's a great danger in the cooperation between the EU and the UK. Uh, they are unequal partners already, um, but there are many areas where they also share interests, both in the uh, continued development of the EU-UK relationship, but also in global issues, whether it's climate change, whether it is the multilateral system, whether it is how we uh, deal with, cooperate with um, the US and China. Um, these are all issues where um, there has to be a certain level of dialogue and hopefully common action. And that brings me back, um, just to, to finish on that, um, to, to this question of dip diplomatic recognition uh, for the EU ambassador. Um, because if the UK 
and there's still a big question whether this has deeper meaning or whether it was just a, a, an individual action uh, which uh, wasn't um, considered uh, to create this uh, level of difficulty. But if the UK really doesn't consider the EU as a political international actor in the same way as other countries consider the EU, then it is very difficult to see how we can get meaningful cooperation on these global issues. Um, so for me, this was a very worrying sign, not only because it showed the uh, possibility of the UK making the uh, relationship more difficult, but it also, in my view, shows that the UK uh, or at least certain parts of the UK government uh, don't consider the EU as the partner, which they should consider the EU as um, to cooperate on these global issues. Thank you, Fabian. Um, before we uh, move on, I just wanted to remind the audience that you can send in uh, your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, or you can also raise your virtual hand if you would like to come in in person. Um, so um, yeah, what Fabian describes is a lot of potential for conflict and a difficult relationship to come. Um, so Catherine, I wanted to come back to you um, because the question about um, an either harmonious or conflictual relationship is also directly connected with the question of what happens in the case that there is a dispute. Um, so I wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit on the dispute settlement mechanism that is in the deal. And um, if the UK starts to, test the the, starts to test the limits of divergence, how likely is it that this triggers a dispute settlement? Um, and I guess there's also a bit of a more political question whether disputes will be solved politically or if there will be an endless row of legal disputes. Um, this is, of course, um, a difficult question because it depends also on political choices in the UK and whether the UK will actually diverge. But um, yeah, I was hoping to, to get a sense from you on what you think. Um, thank you very much for that and for the other contributions. Um, uh, at the moment, um, it's not clear the extent to which um, the UK government is going to take advantage of what it sees as the Brexit dividend, which is divergence. Um, I think that confusion was summed up um, in the approach taken by Kwasi Kwarteng, who is the new uh, Secretary of State for Business. Um, the FT had a story to say that the UK was thinking of tearing up the working time regulations, implementing working time directive. He came out and said, oh, no, we're not. And then a couple of days later, he said, well, oh, yes, we might be, but we're looking into it. Um, and so the question then is, um, what level of divergence might occur? Now, if we were, um, I mean, if you look at the working time directive, which has always been a bete noire of the um, of many employers and certainly the Brexiteurs, there are bits of the Court of Justice case law that um, a lot of employers have never found comfortable, most notably the fact that you can take um, paid annual leave after a year's um, sick leave. Now, let's just imagine for argument's sake that bit is turned off. Is that really enough to trigger either the non-regression provisions in the TCA, let alone the full uh, re rebalancing mechanism? So salami slicing, will that really be enough? Because remember, there's a threshold um, in respect to the non-regression provisions. There's got to be an effect on trade and investment. Um, under the rebalancing provisions, there's got to be a material um, effect on trade and investment. And just turning off one bit of the Court of Justice case law, that seems unlikely to trigger either. But what happens if there's a more um, rigorous salami, salami slicing and cutting off, turning off other bits of the Court of Justice interpretation, or that the working time regulations are turned off in their entirety, as are the agency work regulations, which are also deeply unpopular with some employers, as are the um, provisions on information and consultation over collective redundancies. And if you go down that route, you can see already the particularly the French rubbing their hands and saying, well, this is really um, divergence and so should be dealt with under the pretty brutal um, provisions on rebalancing. 
you asked specifically about the dispute resolution mechanism. There isn't one. In fact, there are several dispute resolution mechanisms scattered across the um, treaty. And there's a certain Alice in Wonderland quality about these dispute resolution mechanisms because they say there is a general dispute resolution mechanism which broadly follows um, the WTO um, approach, but there's no appeal. Um, and it's based on, first of all, consultation, so political, um, before you get before your panel um, and uh, of arbitrators um, when it becomes slightly more, somewhat more legal. Um, in respect of the bits I've just been talking about, non-regression and rebalancing, they appear to have their own dispute resolution mechanism. But in fact, when you look a bit more deeply, they cross refer back into the main um, dispute resolution mechanism, particularly the bit on retaliation. And then the question is, what about the rebalancing mechanism? That's the much more ra radical, um, brutal um, mechanism. Well, in fact, um, there's got to be a working, uh, the, the panel, if it goes to a panel, I've got 30 days to sort things out. And if not, the EU can still um, apply um, its tariffs. And I think that's the potential danger because of course, if the EU goes in all guns blazing, which they might well do for the reason that Elvia has said, of course, this will fuel the anti-EU rhetoric in the UK in the way that Fabian's just described. And so again, it's for the EU to think how it wants to deal with this rather complicated porcupine and how it wants, to, does it want to provoke it or does it want to um, give it a bit of latitude given that the treaty says in several places that both sides are free to set their own standards. And that of course is one of the aspects of, of Brexit. The EU would say we need to protect the single market, but as we're already seeing, the barriers that the EU have very successfully put up to protect the single market are extraordinarily strong. And the implications for business in terms of dealing with all of the um, uh, primarily non-tariff barriers at the border are an enormous cost to business. And so the fact is that business is taking a huge hit, which it will not cover by the fact that it's not paying sick leave to, oh, sorry, it's not paying holiday pay to sick workers um, um, at the end of a year's sick leave. I mean, the costs for business, as Fabiana said, have been huge. Sorry, I failed to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Catherine, for uh, this assessment. Um, building on this question of what happens um, if the UK diverges significantly, um, I wanted to ask Katie um, what she thinks the implications for Northern Ireland um, would be. I mean, what happens in a scenario where Westminster decides to diverge from EU standards in a significant way? Um, how do you see that impacting the long-term trajectory in Northern Ireland in terms of economic but also political developments? Um, also keeping in mind that um, the next Northern Ireland Assembly election is expected in May 2022 and the first consent process in Northern Ireland will take place in late 2024. Um, so how do you see this play out or what kind of scenarios do you maybe foresee? Thanks, Janneke. Yes, and this question enables me to answer the question in the chat as well about sausages, um, which as a vegetarian, I seem to spend a lot of time talking about these days. Um, so yes, the risk, so for Northern Ireland, um, Obviously, the protocol means dynamic alignment for Northern Ireland uh, to the EU's uh, rules um, in certain areas of the single market for goods. So um, there's a potential for um, pressure, if you like, on the Irish Sea border um, in, in two ways. So the one is if, um, sort of as and when, I guess, the EU standards increase. So automatically, if those um, um, instruments of legislation in, the, in Annex 2 are uh, amended um, or updated, then that applies in Northern Ireland, or indeed if it's anticipated that a certain new aspect of legislation in the EU would be relevant for the protocol, that may well be incorporated as well. So Northern Ireland would diverge from GB in that regard, from Great Britain in that regard, plus then also if GB, any, any part of Great Britain, so um, any government of the UK deciding to diverge, then again, that has implications. Um, it's difficult to 
I'd be careful not to or exaggerate the the impact of it. Um, I think that already, I mean, we've been left in no doubt that the EU is taking that, um, you know, the arrangements in the protocol very seriously. And although we are conscious that we're in a, a certain number of grace periods at the moment, um, there is no um, ambiguity, I think, about the EU's insistence that single market um, customs rules will apply in Northern Ireland. Um, and just to pick up on Fabian's point earlier about blaming the EU, I mean, one thing that you've made me think, actually, I mean, one thing that is striking is that we don't have much blame, blaming of the EU going on for GB to NI friction. Instead, what we have is, a, is more promises from the government, sort of downplaying the significance in the first instance, saying it's COVID mainly, um, which is true to some degree, but also emphasizing the need for permanent solutions. So giving this idea that there's ongoing negotiation with the EU. Um, and I think this is where my primary concern of the moment would be. And that is how those decisions, how that negotiation is taking place. I don't think it is taking place at the moment. I think there's a lot of close communication between officials, but my, my longer concern, deeper concern is how those decisions are made. So the, the instruments of governance of the protocol, we have the joint committee, the specialized committee on the protocol, and then the joint consultative working group. That last body, which is about um, uh, mutual exchange of information and consultation between the UK and the EU, that's meant to be meeting monthly. Um, it's not been established yet. Um, and the longer that's held off, the, the, the um, deeper the concerns about the, uh, the representation of Northern Ireland are in all of this. And this is why I think there are some dangers vis-a-vis -vis the elections in 2022, which are already being framed as this is about the protocol and Northern Ireland being done over and the breakup of the UK. Um, and then, of course, about that consent vote in 2024 on Articles 5 to 10. Um, this, does, this, this consent vote is not enough to legitimise the protocol. What we need much more fundamentally is something that shows, um, it's almost like, um, I'm working with my colleague David Finham on this question of problem solving as legitimacy, like throughput legitimacy for this protocol. And this is where the Joint Consultative Working Group, and to a lesser degree, or a different, a different degree, the specialized committee come into play, that it's possible for people to say, yes, Northern Ireland's concerns are being heard here directly. Um, and, um, and the responses are being made on the basis of good information from Northern Ireland. Uh, because as you know, I mean, we're not just geographically peripheral, but politically peripheral to the UK and to the EU. And uh, I, I think just sort of, um, urge the sort of establishment of the JCWG as soon as possible so that people can see, yes, we are being represented, we are being heard uh, for these concerns that are very real and going to be feeling more real when on the 1st of July, for example, we won't be having any more um, British sausages or not GB made sausages <laughs> or mints entering Northern Ireland. Thank you, Katie. Um, so We've spoken a bit about the um, specific implications for Northern Ireland, um, but we've also received a question from our audience um, on the consequences of the deal for Scotland and Scottish independence, um, which is directed to Fabian. Um, Fabian, would you like to respond to this one? Sure, happy to, to pick that one up. Um, um, I think firstly, um, I think we have had a, uh, if you like, difficult situation um, for the UK in Scotland ever since the Brexit referendum. Um, uh, clearly, the difference in the vote uh, between uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK um, was very significant. Um, uh, it was also uh, fairly unanimous uh, in Scotland. Uh, in terms of support for EU membership. Um, and those difficulties um, were not going to go away no matter what kind of deal was going to be struck because in the end, uh, the only uh, possibility uh, of not having that impact uh, would have been a continuation of membership. Um, uh, we can see that uh, the 
the fact of Brexit has influenced uh, the behavior uh, of uh, Scots, at least uh, if you look at the opinion polls, um, there now seems to be um, a, um, not a large majority, but a significant majority uh, which uh, express that they would vote for independence uh, in an independence referendum. Um, so I think this trend has been, uh, if you like, um, fortified now through uh, having this deal, because in reality, uh, and that is the big thing which has changed in comparison to the 2014 uh, independence referendum. In reality, the only uh, route which is feasible for uh, those Scottish voters uh, who would like to be in the European Union is through independence. Uh, and that is going to continue to fuel the debate in Scotland. So um, what we are going to see uh, is a, uh, an election campaign um, for the Scottish Parliament in May, which is going to be debated um, around this twin question uh, of independence and EU membership. Um, and the most likely outcome, at least if polls are to believed, is a majority for the SNP, which will go into uh, the uh, referendum, uh, sorry, into the election campaign with a promise uh, of uh, another independence uh, referendum. Now that uh, carries some difficulties uh, from an SNP perspective. Uh, because uh, so far uh, a referendum uh, needs to be sanctioned by Westminster and uh, the uh, government uh, in London has made it clear that it has no intention um, to do that. Um, there could well be court cases. Uh, there are some arguments uh, which uh, say that legally um, if the outcome of the election is as people expect, uh, that there might be a legal route, um, but certainly it will be a life issue. Um, so from a European perspective, uh, I think it is an issue which we need to have on the radar um, because uh, it is not going to go away. Um, and it might well be uh, a question of whether uh, Europe would consider membership of an independent Scotland uh, and under what conditions. Um, and I think this is uh, something where um, we haven't really engaged at the European level in a serious way in this um, because uh, of the context. Um, but now uh, I think it is something uh, which we will need to consider. Um, certainly um, the European commentators will be asked about the um, perspective of Scotland, uh, if Scotland does become independent, if it becomes independent in a constitutional way versus a non-constitutional way, um, what kind of terms and conditions the EU might set, um, but certainly uh, it is a life issue, um, which in my view will be on the agenda, certainly for uh, the uh, foreseeable future. Thank you, Fabian. Um, we have a virtually, hand, virtually raised hand from our audience um, as well. So we will try to um, bring Francis in. Um, Francis, um, the floor is yours. You could pose your question now. Um, but I think you are self muted. So you would have to unmute yourself first. Let's see. If it doesn't work at the moment, we come back to you later, but we also have another virtually rent, raised hand from John Palmer. Um, maybe we, we try with John next. John, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I, I want to ask the panel's opinion on to what extent the future security framework for Europe will loom as large in shaping the Anglo uh, the UK-EU relationship as the trade economic policy issues. Um, it's unclear to me at any rate whether in the post-Trump world uh, will be simply a reversion back to normal 
or whether the balance of security uh, within the Western Alliance might move to a bigger role for the European Union in that field, and whether that is another friction area uh, beneath the surface of uh, UK, uh, EU future relations. Thank you, John. Um, I think that is um, almost two questions in one. On the one hand, um, about the future security framework between the EU and the UK going forward, we know that there are currently no formal arrangements um, as part of this um, TCA. Um, but then there's also a question about the future of the EU US UK triangle and um, the new transatlantic relationship and how that will impact on uh, security considerations in the EU and the UK. Um, would anyone from the panel like to go first on this one? Fabian? I'm happy to go first. Um, I think uh, certainly security, um, foreign policy um, uh, issues uh, which uh, are uh, important but unresolved. Um, essentially, for the moment, at least, it seems that the UK government has no intention uh, of uh, having a relationship on this issue with the EU. And with that, I mean the EU institutions, of course. Uh, there will be a relationship um, which is already there, for example, on a bilateral basis uh, between France and the UK. There are a number of, of uh, areas in the security field where there is a cooperation. Um, so um, for the moment, at least, uh, certainly those uh, bilateral uh, cooperations will continue. Uh, there is the cooperation within NATO, uh, which will continue to be uh, one of the central uh, planks of security policy in Europe, uh, reinforced by a new president uh, in Washington. Um, not that uh, a Biden presidency means that uh, some of the dissatisfaction of the United States with European security arrangements are, is going to go away. Uh, clearly, there is an expectation that Europe will take more responsibility. And that also means uh, Europe will put more money into its own security and its own defense. Um, but I think this will be done through forum like NATO, uh, rather than um, threatening with withdrawal, threatening uh, with the cancellation of the arrangements which are there. Um, I think it will be challenging uh, to work together um, if uh, there isn't the possibility to use uh, some of the EU instruments, uh, I think there's the whole big question of uh, the security uh, industrial complex and how we deal with the market, uh, which is there, um, where the EU does have significant competences. Um, there are also a number of issues where we will have to decide in how far uh, the UK is inside the tent or outside the tent uh, when it comes to uh, security arrangements, uh, intelligence sharing. I mean, there are a number of areas where this has not actually been resolved. Um, but I think that in the end, um, this is one area where at least uh, as long as we have this government in the UK and things might change if there is a change in government, but as long as we have this government, I don't see uh, how we can actually improve. Um, and I see that there are a number of potential areas also of conflict. Um, what happens once we start seeing uh, substantively different decisions being made in the UK on certain issues? Um, and that will happen, whether it's on sanctions, whether it is on uh, security arrangements, whether it is on uh, uh, particular powers of uh, police and data. I mean, these are things where uh, there were already frictions inside the European Union. So uh, we can actually expect that these will get worse over time. Thank you, Fabian. I think Evia would like to um, come in on this as well. Well, just a short reaction to, to what Fabian said. I mean, following what Fabian said. Uh, 
obviously the increase um, of um, uh, public investment in, in the defense sector is, uh, is a sign that uh, the, the UK uh, intends to remain um, a strong security actor on the, on the global scene. Um, but the, the willingness to, to, uh, to increase the links with the US uh, means also that uh, security, um, uh, security engagement will be very closely linked to Washington and to the alignment of the, the UK on, on the, the new US uh, policy. Um, I tend to think that uh, if, if we're talking about uh, how the UK wants to engage on, on its uh, Global Britain uh, project, uh, there may be other uh, issues on which, uh, and other sectors on which the UK could make the difference as being a, a good rocker. And, uh, and uh, uh, it, it may not be directly into uh, 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 to trying to, to engage uh, on, on specific uh, geographical areas or, uh, but maybe more on, on issues like uh, climate change or which are, could be seen as a sort of alternative for the, for the UK uh, to, to build that new, uh, uh, new post-Brexit uh, global Britain uh, identity. Thank you, Avia. Um, I would actually like to, to stay with you, Avia, and um, maybe also ask you to um, comment on another question we, we've received from um, the audience um, from Guillaume Zapatero, who is asking, do you think the TCA can become a model for other third countries? So um, maybe the question is also, what lessons will the EU draw from these negotiations for its relationships with third countries in general? And um, will third countries have new demands modeled on this EU-UK relationship? Um, for example, when we look at the, um, at the no involvement for the European Court of Justice, um, so do you, see, uh, do you see any implications there um, in the EU's, on the, for the EU's relationship with third countries in general? Well, I think TCA can be really considered as a very ad hoc agreement for the UK as a very specific uh, uh, partner. And it was, uh, it was presented like that by uh, EU negotiators. Uh, UK is very, so, uh, so integrated in the, in the single market, such a, I mean, it's a big economy and, and closely linked to uh, all EU partners. Uh, so it was, a, uh, it had to be a very specific design um, agreement. Of course, um, if we're talking about the interests of th third countries, um, it would be more a, a sort of selection of third countries, very close partners, such as Switzerland, who, uh, who has been uh, closely watching the evolution of the negotiation and the outcome of the T TCA. Um, I think that um, on the level playing field, it has been um, it has been a strong message sent by the EU to, uh, to a partner like, like Switzerland, because precisely it has, uh, it has pointed to that more uh, willingness on the EU side to introduce that sort of rebalancing between benefits and, and duties with, uh, with third country partners. And I, I wouldn't see any, I wouldn't see any important concessions made to a, a third country partner as the UK that could benefit to um, um, obviously to, uh, to another third country uh, who could, uh, uh, who would want to, to, uh, to introduce that or to renegotiate that in, the, in their current partnership. Um, I would tend to think that it is more a sort of um, template for, for other future negotiation um, I don't know if we have to jump straight away onto the EU-China side, and to because uh, it's an uh, it's another very different situation. But uh, but the the main pillar of the EU-China deal is precisely to uh, to to uh, the the rebalancing of the of the relation and to introduce that level playing field as a structural factor of the negotiation. And, uh, and I think that would be the, the, really the legacy of the TCA. 
Thank you, Avia. Um, if anyone else would like to come in on this, uh, yeah, okay, Fabian. <laughs> Um, I think Catherine wanted to come in before uh, already, so I'll, I'll let her come in. Okay, first. sorry, I didn't see that. Catherine, you go first then. Thank you. I would just like to make um, two points. Um, one, um, in respect to the question about um, uh, security arrangements, um, I think one of the positive aspects of the TCA, which was unexpected, was the extent of cooperation that has been built in over internal security matters, so over police um, cooperation over if not the european arrest warrant something which is not so very different um and i think um actually it was to the credit of both sides that they recognized that there was a mutual interest to develop all of this we know it's tricky because of um, issues of constitutional courts and so forth but what's there is um i think a great improvement and actually if we're looking for something positive this would be a way of building and um of um building um cooperation in respect of the point, is the TCA a model for elsewhere? I mean, it is worth bearing in mind that the TCA in many places looks very much like a cross between EU Canada, um, EU Japan. Um, and there's not that, leaving aside the police um, and security cooperation I've just referred to, there's not so much which is specific to um, the UK. There are odd nuggets that you can find, for example, about use of um, home title by lawyers. But in fact, it looks pretty much like the EU Canada Agreement, which is what the UK said it wanted and what Michel Barnier said pretty early on, that's what we would be getting. Um, I know, and I can see uh, Georges Bauer is in the audience and he knows lots more about this than I do, but um, that Switzerland have been um, looking at this very carefully um, and looking at the CCA very carefully and seeing if it's a model that um, Switzerland might want to join. And you can see that the equivalent of the Swiss Brexiteurs might well see that there's something attractive about um, this arrangement for Switzerland. Um, but we also know the problems um, associated with it. Uh, the final thing I also want to say, which is a, a bigger picture issue, is that I think the question about how the EU wants to manage its relationships with the UK, but also Great Britain, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland is really quite an important one. Of course, it's not front and foremost because you've, the, you've got plenty of other things to worry about. But the fact is um, the UK is sitting on its border and is indeed the land bridge between Ireland and um, the EU. And the UK isn't going to go away as a problem. And so the question is, does the EU do some really serious thinking about how it would like that relationship to evolve, if, if at all, or whether it would like it to evolve in respect of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, I was giving evidence to, to the Welsh uh, Senate yesterday where there was a huge appetite for the Wales to be much close, more closely linked to the EU, but they didn't know how they might be able to do that. And whether there's a way for Wales, and I imagine uh, Katie can talk about Northern Ireland, to have some sort of connection with the EU independent of that of the, U the rest of the UK. I think the answer at the moment is categorically not, but is there any creative thinking going on? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Fabian, would you still like to um, comment on this as well? Yeah, just briefly, I, I think on uh, the, the TCA as a model, um, I think we should bear in mind that from an EU perspective, what was in the political declaration would have been far more desirable than what we got in the end. Um, I think clearly uh, the deal is um, a good deal if you take into account the British red lines, which were about leaving the single market and leaving the customs union. Um, but if you had the possibility to have something more ambitious, which also would contain, um, for example, provisions in terms of dynamic um, alignment of rules and regulations, uh, having a much closer uh, economic relationship, also benefiting, for example, from uh, the capital markets in London, uh, that would have been far more desirable. So it's not that this deal is actually all the EU wanted. It is all the EU wanted in light of uh, the red lines which the UK had. So I don't really see this as a model for the relationship with anyone else, um, with some countries um, directly close to uh, the uh, EU. I think the desire is still to have them within the single market, uh, which has certain implications, um, 
And certainly I, I don't see anyone moving away from the principle of the uh, EEA um, agreement at the moment. Um, I think with countries outside uh, further distance, uh, it's a different uh, arrangement in any case. Uh, it doesn't raise the same question as with the UK. So I think it is um, from an EU perspective, a good deal in the sense that it meets uh, the negotiation criteria but in the bigger picture, it's a bad deal um, for everybody because in the end, uh, it only has a rather minimal level of cooperation. Thank you. Um, Katie, I don't know if you um, would maybe like to comment on um, what Catherine said about um, um, well, a, a potential desire within parts of Northern Ireland to maybe have a closer relationship with the EU and um, maybe on one um, thing that already happened, um, which is the Erasmus scheme and the possibility for Northern Irish students to, to still take part in this, how this is being seen in Northern Ireland. Well, you'll be surprised to hear that it's been highly politicised. <laughs> <laughs> So um, yes, the Irish government said it would enable, and it's been saying this for a long time, um, and I had it in its, um, uh, it's, it's, yes, it's been saying it would have, do this for a long time, so that it would enable uh, students in Northern Ireland universities to access Erasmus, um, which is, has been broadly welcome. Um, although, as with all of these things, as I say, it's seen um, in some quarters as being Irish government interference, which sort of points to this difficulty that we have. So in terms of representing Northern Ireland's views, and I um, did a study with David Finnamore, my colleague in Queens on this, um, looking at EEA countries and how um, sort of association countries have, um, uh, and neighbours have representation in the EU and to the EU, to sort of have just decision shaping roles and of course this is possible for to some degree for EEA countries many of them rely on the informal mechanisms um, and uh, these as you know work, work pretty well in the EU context but this is where we we fall down somewhat because of Northern Ireland's very limited resources and it's, it's very small and also the question of uh, what are Northern Ireland's interests um, many Sort of assume that Northern Ireland's representation um, and limited influence won't just come through those formal mechanisms such as the JCWG, but uh, uh, for which we rely, of course, on the UK government allowing Northern Ireland officials to be present, uh, but also through the Irish government. Um, and there are close links between the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and, um, and Northern Ireland officials and, and communities, but it has to be handled very, very sensitively. Um, and I know already that some officials in Northern Ireland are thinking quite imaginatively about how we can utilize those uh, Northern Ireland's presence, such as it can be in Brussels and, and with various member states. Um, it's a difficult one. I, I, there's a question in the, in the um, Q&A about SPS and CETA, and it's just to sort of mention, because it does have implications for GB to NIE. So essentially, um, uh, the, the, um, there's no capacity for, mut for mutual recognition. So to recognize that the SPS measures in both parties are equivalent, um, which of course just um, does increase the need for checks and controls in relation to SPS. Um, and um, as I say, I think this, you know, it would have been an obvious way to minimize the friction on the Irish sea border. Um, the UK has chosen not to do that in order to, you know, really limit those ties. And also we can, we've already seen signs that the UK wants to diverge in those areas. For example, it might be kite flying, but in relation to pesticide use, for example, or genetic editing. So um, we will see the knock on effects of that um, in terms of that harder Irish sea border. And then longer term, what will that mean for Northern Ireland businesses? How will they adapt to that? Um, whether we can make the most of access into the EU. And, and one sort of slight concern people have had here is that there's been very limited understanding of Northern Ireland's unique position, uh, both in GB, hence some of the difficulties in GB goods coming into Northern Ireland, but also the rest of the EU, not necessarily appreciating that Northern Ireland is still in the single market for goods. 
um, just as sort of associating Northern Ireland with the rest of the UK and therefore as a third country. So there's a long way to go about information about Northern Ireland's distinct position and then building on that. And again, we sort of have a hand slightly tied by the politics of it all, not just within Northern Ireland, but also UK, EU. Thank you, Katie. Um, so I think um, one thing is, has become quite clear from, from our discussion that, um, well, on the one hand, um, given um, the UK's focus on sovereignty, but also the unusually short time frame to negotiate this TCA and the red lines on both sides, this deal might have been the maximum available. Um, and um, in order to build on this deal, um, the red lines on the UK side would probably have to shift in one way or another. Um, so um, this uh, agreement is very dynamic and organic, um, and but the question is whether there's actually the political appetite uh, on both sides to build on this deal. Um, and also the question how this can happen um, apart from, from political uh, incentives, but also um, how this can happen within the institutional framework of the of the agreement. And Catherine, I wanted to ask you whether you could uh, briefly maybe comment on the powers of the Partnership Council um, to amend this deal and to potentially build on, on certain areas. Thank you. I, I think this is one of the really important aspects of the um, deal. Um, I think it's got an internal and an external dimension. The internal dimension is um, who from the UK will appear um, before on the Partnership uh, Council, plus possibly as importantly, the 18 committees and four working groups. And this is not just a question of personality, but also to what extent will the devolved um, uh, nations be represented on those committees? Um, this, this has got a further in, internal dimension that, um, leaving aside Northern Ireland, that Scotland and Wales in particular feel that their voices have not been listened to um, very much, if at all, in this process. And the very fact that the deal was pushed through Parliament in a day, uh, there was no legislative consent motion from um, Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland, suggests, shows just the extent to which um, the devolved nations feel uh, excluded from this process. Um, and one way of trying to get them back on board would be to make sure that there is representation from those parts of the UK nation uh, on all of those bodies and that they have a good knowledge of what's going on in those bodies so that they can feed into them. So that's the, what I want to say about the internal side. Um, on the external side, i.e. dealing with the EU, um, clearly, there are areas in the agreement which the um, Partnership Council um, can um, amend the treaty, not just where there's been errors found in the treaty that um, need to be rectified, but areas which have been put, um, uh, identified in the body of the text. In fact, from that point of view, it works rather like the Joint Committee under the Withdrawal Agreement. And I think the less politicised those bodies are, the more likely that trust can be rebuilt at official level. And to an extent, I think we see some of that occurring in Northern Ireland um, over the protocol. Um, the other point I would just want to draw to your attention was the um, body involving um, the European Parliament and the UK Parliament, the um, Joint uh, Parliamentary Assembly, I think it's called. Um, uh, I'm told that the EU is more enthusiastic about that than the UK, um, and it does the provision in the in the TCA expressly refers to UK side representation being from the United Kingdom Parliament, which presumably means Westminster, and thus no space for um, the devolved administrations again, which again causes uh, fur further internal strife. The question then is, what role will this body have, and? Uh, the civil society forum that's also in, um, envisaged, how can you make them anything more than talking shops? Um, and how can they actually deliver something of benefit to their constituencies? Thank you, Catherine. I think those are two very important points. Um, the role that the parliamentary assembly and the civil society forum can play in the broader sense of, 
of the relationship. And um, we also have another question from um, the audience, um, which is um, asking um, basically um, how we could envisage a successful EU-UK relationship in a broader setting and in more global terms and what su success will look like. Um, maybe Fabian and Elvia as our speakers from the EU side, so to say, um, could come, come in on this question. Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Well, um, well I think precisely uh, that we, we, uh, we could pay attention to those uh, global challenges that maybe further away from internal market issues uh, could bring together the two, the two parties on a more constructive ground. Uh, I mentioned just before climate change, and obviously it's an issue on which there's a, uh, there, there, there would be room for consensus and building, um, uh, building many ways of cooperation if we think about uh, the need to cooperate in, into, in innovation and uh, we, I mean, which could bring us from the more political level to more economic level, and who could uh, be a leverage to uh, for cooperation on on different fields of policy. Um, but in climate change, as uh, on issues like uh, addressing uh, China, the China challenge, uh, it will obviously be a triangular uh, uh, setup between the EU, the UK and the US. And it will also depend on the way Joe Biden um, intends to uh, intend to manage his uh, bilateral relation with the UK and, uh, and with the EU. If he, uh, if he keeps uh, as an objective uh, the idea to preserve some stability between the UK and the EU, or if uh, uh, and that, I mean, that would be very quite in line with his objective to, to, to work with the lies and to, to, uh, to sort of uh, uh, build up um, a stage for cooperation between, between the lies, or if um, his um, policy, particularly in, in, in regards to China, which still uh, requires some clarification, uh, is more built on an alignment on, on US interests and uh, which would tend to um, which would tend to introduce in the bilateral relation between the EU and the UK more com more competition between two strategies being aligned on the on the US side or be more cooperative with, with the EU um, I, I, I I think that there is still some great potential for rivalry, even on, on those issues between the EU and the UK. Thank you. Fabian, would you like to add to this as well? Yes, um, I, I think it's very difficult because essentially we have uh, two divorcees uh, which had a huge fight and are still continuing to bicker on a number of different issues. And we're now asking them to set that aside and to work constructively on some other issues. Um, I think it can be done, um, but uh, I think in the near future, at least, uh, I would say the only chance we have of doing that is if we treat it as issue by issue, rather than tying everything together into the overall relationship. Uh, because once we start then trading off and uh, it, it then opens up all the wounds which have been created by this. But I think it's also important to recognize that post-transition is not pre-transition. Uh, there has been a significant change in the relationship. Sometimes it feels like both sides haven't quite realized this yet, uh, that uh, both sides are still uh, in a way treating each other mm -hmm. as if they're still members of the same club. Um, and uh, the, the reality is that um, there's also a change now in the different interests. So, for example, when it comes to economic cooperation, I'm rather skeptical about uh, us achieving any further deepening uh, of the TCA, because we now have a situation where um, we have economic vested interests on both sides 
which are building on the current status quo. Um, and if you're then wanting to disrupt that status quo again, you will have to overcome those vested economic interests. So for example, there are a number of companies now uh, on the continent which are benefiting from a rerouting of trade routes. Uh, we have seen um, when you look at Ireland, uh, the, the land bridge uh, through the UK has gone. There are many new trade routes now opening up between Ireland directly to France. Uh, these are the kind of things which are not going to be disrupted again. Um, so you're not going through a second transition. When, it, when we look at services, uh, we haven't talked about services, but uh, services not completely, but uh, in substantive ways have been excluded from this agreement. Um, now, uh, having a, a new agreement on services would mean that for continental service providers, there would be an added competition, which is added back into the market. So they would have to see a significant economic benefit elsewhere to consider that. So I think this situation is unfortunately a very difficult one to deal with. Um, and I think rather than thinking about a very ambitious uh, um, relationship, I think we need to uh, try to manage the relationship we have now as well as we can so that we have at least a minimal level of cooperation on some of the global issues. Uh, where that goes in five years time, in 10 years time, that's a different question. But for the moment, I think it really is about focusing on some issues and then trying to take those separately uh, from uh, the economic relationship, from the difficulties we have in that. Uh, so for, for me, uh, the obvious one to focus on in the immediate future is the climate change issue um, with COP. 26 uh, with the G7 presidency in the UK, uh, but also with a new administration, which gives us a chance to play this ball a little bit over the trend, uh, over the Atlantic rather than directly between us. I think that's one of the issues where uh, there is a chance that we can achieve something, uh, but we really have to be careful that we don't contaminate that cooperation with uh, the conflict, which will still be there on a number of other issues. Thank you, Fabian. Um, so we have almost come uh, to the end of our discussion today. And I think we've almost replied to all the questions from the audience as well. So um, I just wanted to pose one final question to each of you um, and ask you to be brief in your answer, um, maybe one minute each. Um, we've already touched on this a bit, but it's also kind of a crystal ball question. Um, which is, do you expect this deal um, to lead to a closer relationship between the EU and the UK over time? Or do you expect a gradual distancing, um, if not even a falling apart of the deal? Um, maybe we start with Elvia, um, Catherine, Katie, and then Fabian. I, I don't expect a uh, falling apart of the deal. Um, I, th I think it's there. It will keep us busy just to, to, to learn how to, uh, to manage the deal and the new relation. And that's why I wouldn't expect even some, uh, some uh, meaningful attempt to, uh, to build up a new cooperation on the basis of this deal. I think we will, uh, for, for, for one, two, many years, uh, first limit the damage made by uh, this new relation, uh, learn how to, to, to work with it, and then, uh, as Catherine just said before, maybe at the level of more, uh, the more technical level, the level of agencies and the level of uh, regulators, we could expect some work on mutual recognition in some, in some fields, little by little, very concretely. Uh, it won't be very easily uh, visible and the, the, the lisibility of that uh, slow uh, building uh, cooperative work uh, wouldn't be uh, uh, obvious um, and uh, it will be under the radar of a more uh, political, uh, more tense uh, exchange uh, with more official rivalry 
and uh, dealing to dealing with the divergence between the, and the, the how we're going to how are we going to manage with this divergence as much on the level in the level playing field uh, chapter as on more structural issues like uh, in in uh, financial services and data transfer this is going to be much more tricky because this is would be much more structural it wouldn't be another uh, a rebalancing exercise it would be losing uh, the the uh, the equivalence that the, we, we expect the EU uh, would be given uh, in, in the coming month. But this is really suspended to more geopolitical issues and uh, notably on the data transfer issue, uh, that the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the willingness for the UK to reach on the CPTPP uh, will be a major uh, test for, for this uh, cooperation in the data field. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, Catherine? Thanks. I would uh, broadly agree with that. I would say two things. One, um, to manage this deal, it should be as boring as possible. Um, because And so it's got to be done at a technical civil service level. And I know why Tall are giving a lot of thought to how to manage that. The problem is at the political level, it's going to carry on being spiky, grumpy, bad tempered and sniping. Um, and I think this is going to be very unfortunate. I think the um, incident over the precise diplomatic status of the EU ambassador is a taste of things to come. The Boris Johnson's got to keep showing to uh, the Brexiters and his party that he is a true believer. And so this is a very public way of doing it. There are technical arguments as to why the EU ambassador should not be given full ambassadorial status, but the reality is that the optics of it are terrible. And that's what I mean about it being spiky and difficult for months ahead. And if the economy gets worse in the UK with COVID, see more EU bashing. Thank you. Katie, your take? Yeah, it still feels a little bit like, um a bit of a just the realities of Brexit haven't sunk in yet so there's two reasons for that one is Covid uh, of course which is such a strange and awful situation for all of us to be in and then the second thing is like it's been almost 50 years generations have grown up in the UK as EU citizens with um, all of the habits of Europeanness whether they <laughs> necessarily recognized or not and I think the all the gaps and all the changes that this uh, TCA means um, for services, for individuals, for families, etc. I mean, the, the long term implications of that will really only be felt over time. And uh, most definitely, it'll be a distancing and uh, uh, and all that that entails, you know, is it's very um, sad to see. Thank you. Uh, Fabian, uh, last words. Uh, um, I think what, what we have seen now uh, is that uh, we have partially settled the economic relationship. Um, but even there, uh, what we are going to see now, um, and I think this has already started, uh, but uh, Katie's right, uh, we will continue to see that, is this drip feed of economic cost, which will continue um, to impact on the relationship. Uh, because uh, for those who have supported Brexit in the UK, uh, it will be impossible to admit that this is the normal cost of Brexit. Uh, that is what was expected, uh, and that is what is now happening. But they will continue to have to argue that uh, this is the EU doing this to us. This is something which is being imposed on us. Um, when it comes to the political relationship, we haven't even started to settle that yet. Um, and I think that is a much longer term process uh, where there is also still a lot of potential for friction, for acrimony. Um, I think one of the key issues why the political relationship won't be settled for a long time is because the political system in the UK is not stable. Um, so what kind of relationship can we have uh, if things are changing uh, on the other side, not least uh, that we even have a question about the territorial integrity of the UK. Uh, we don't even know whether the UK will still exist in its current form in five, six years time, whatever time frame you want to put on this. So I think uh, what we are going to see um, is divergence and is instability, and that will impact also 
on uh, the relationship between the EU and the UK, there will be a time when the provisions will be used um, for uh, addressing what is seen by the EU as unacceptable divergence. And that will then raise the question of what is the political reaction in the UK. So uh, I don't expect that the relationship is going to break down anytime soon, but I also don't expect it to be stable over the long term. This is not the final settled uh, uh, relationship um, because so many changes are still uh, going to come. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your, um, for your assessments, for your inputs and views um, and your expertise. Um, we have come to the end of our panel discussion today, um, certainly to be continued in the future. Um, thanks a lot to our panelists, to Elvia, Catherine, Katie and Fabian um, for taking the time um, to discuss the TCA with us today. Uh, and thanks also to our audience for attending this event. Um, and I wish you all a pleasant afternoon. <laughs>